Hey everyone, good afternoon. I'm Susan Kaufman. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD experts broadcast. It's back to school for many of our families this week or last week even. Um, and today we're talking with Susan Yellen, an attorney and pediatri pediatrician, Paul Yellen, who are directors at the Yellen Institute for Mind, Brain and Education here in New York. Um, we are going to be talking today about how to build an effective 504 plan or an IEP plan with very specific interventions that will address your child's specific challenges. As you probably know, IEPs and 504s can include a huge variety of services from modified curriculum, related speech and language, occupational therapy, and so forth, um, just for examples. So what we'll be talking about today is how to work with your IEP or 504 team to craft some thoughtful, proven strategies that'll both demonstrate what your child does know and work to improve their areas of challenge. Um, let me introduce uh, Susan and Paul Yellen to you. They have been wonderful um, advocates and helpers at Attitude Magazine, a regular columnist on educational issues for us. We are very grateful for their time. Um, Susan is an attorney, as I said, and, and she is the author of the book, Life After High School, a guide for students with disabilities and their families. And Dr. Paul Yellen, who is the director of the Yellen Center, is an associate professor of pediatrics at the NYU School of Medicine and serves as a member of the faculty on the program of developmental beha and behavioral pediatrics. So a uh, long experience working with children with disabilities. And again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Time Timer. Um, I think, I hope most of you know about Time Timer, but in case you don't, it's um, it's an incredible tool recommended by pretty much all ADHD experts and any generally people who want to improve their productivity. It actually displays the passage of time with a disappearing colored disc. It's available both as sort of a mechanical timer, literal timer, and also as an app. And it's a hugely powerful tool for visual thinkers of all ages and abilities, especially for people like people with ADHD who have a hard time managing the understanding the passing of time um, for more information please go to timetimer.com they're offering a wonderful discount for attitude listeners 25 percent off your entire order so again timetimer.com use the discount code edd for that discount and um, i think you'll find it super helpful um, i wanted to uh do a little poll first to ask you what grade level your child is in that will help Susan and Paul as they speak to you um, target their their um, comments. And while uh, you're taking the poll, I want to just mention a few things about um, our new, not so new anymore, but our, our pretty new web uh, webinar interface that you're using. The widgets on your screen are completely resizable, removable, so you can move them around and make them the size that you want. Um, you can submit your questions. You will submit your questions through the Q&A widget after Susan and Paul talk and prevent their, present their slides. We'll have about a half an hour somewhere in there and that range for them to answer your questions. And here's a really important thing. This is a webinar stream through your computer and your internet access. It's very bandwidth intensive, so it's really important that you close any programs or browser sessions that might be running in the background. If your network is slow, the slides might la lag. So just keep in mind that um, for the best uh, experience, please close off, close anything that's open on the internet for you. And now let's see what the results of our poll show. Interesting. We have almost half of you with children in elementary school and then evenly split between middle school and high school and with a few others. So um, there you go, Susan and Paul, that's a challenge for you to cover all those bases. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to the Yellens to talk about making the classroom work for your student. Thank you again so much for being here today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Yellen, obviously. And we're gonna start by looking at IEPs versus 504 plans since we're covering both of these things today. So just briefly to get sort of some context, these two things, an IEP and a 504, arise from different laws that really have different intentions. An IEP is created under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA. It is a law that's aimed at students, and it covers all students, public school, private school, it doesn't matter, from the K through 12 span. 504, which, whose actual name, and you'll never hear it again, is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. 
is an anti-discrimination law, and it's got sections that involve the workplace and college age. The section that's for school age actually mirrors the IDEA. So in a lot of ways, they're the same, but because they arise differently, you should know that Section 504 only applies to schools that get federal funds, which means that most private schools are, do not give you 504 services and accommodations. Some private schools do this, for example, if they give you free federal funded lunches, but other than that, you should know private schools generally know 504. Don't need both of these because they're so similar that if your student has an IEP that usually incorporates most of the things that would be in a 504, we always prefer an IEP because it provides parents with just a little bit more in the way of and due process rights. In other words, rights move ahead if there's a problem. So we've sort of differentiated a bit. Now let's talk about what they require. Both laws require that a student get a free, appropriate public education. We always call this FAPE. Appropriate is a very variable term, but it generally means making progress from year to year, moving ahead in the curriculum. Both laws require that students who qualify, and the qualifications are different, receive regular or special education. This can be modifications in the classroom, accommodations on tests, specialized instruction, reading support, math support, and something we call related aids and services. These are the things that many students get speech and language therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, counseling. All of these things are available under both laws. So the key word in IEP is individualized, and what that means is that the plan has to be based on your child's specific needs. Uh, and it always starts with the assessment, uh, and when an assessment is performed, what typically happens is that a child will be classified as eligible for services under IDEA, and that classification is limited to one of 13 different categories and child is classified as eligible for services if they meet a diagnostic criteria and they require special education services. Now it's important to know though that the classifications are not the same things as a diagnosis. So for example, typically children with ADHD who get services because of that disorder will get classified under what's called other health impaired or OHI. Uh, and so that the uh, ch your child may be classified. So let's say your child's in the fourth grade is diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and does need special education services. And now the committee needs to make that determination. They will classify that child as eligible for services and they'd say we're classifying the child as eligible under the criteria OHI. Now it's important to understand that that's a very broad category uh, and yet your child's IEP and 504 plan needs to be driven by your child's specific needs so that one needs to drill in more deeply than simply that, that diagnostic category. The other thing that's important to understand is that the assessment that needs to be done also needs to be individualized and so that it may not be sufficient for the school to just give a predetermined battery of tests. Um, you know, the analogy I would give would be is, is quite often we'll see that a child is really struggling and the school will do an assessment and say everything's fine, uh, your child is average across the board and our pushback would be to say it's kind of like if you went to your doctor and you said my knee hurts and your doctor said your x-ray is normal, well it just means that you didn't, didn't find the problem and so that when a child is really struggling just because they did a predetermined set of tests and didn't find a problem does not mean that there may not be a problem. Um, so typically uh, a child the assessment needs to go 
more broadly than simply establishing eligibility for services, but really needs to delineate what your child's specific needs are, because that's how you're going to determine whether or not the IEP is is providing appropriate support. Uh, and it isn't just delineating uh, your child's challenges, it's also delineating abilities and strengths, uh, because the IEP is not just to help with what's wrong, but it's also to uh, enable your child to thrive and succeed. Uh, so, so delineating a child's strengths and challenges is important. Um, identifying a specific area of breakdown responsible for your child's difficulties is critical. So for example, if your child has a reading disorder, it makes a difference whether or not the child can't, is having trouble reading because they can't sound out words or they're having trouble reading because they're having difficulty remembering the top of the page by the time they get to the bottom of the page. Um, so it becomes important to be specific. Uh, in addition to uh, providing uh, a definition of where the breakdowns are, uh, areas of strength need to be identified so that they can be strengthened or so that strategies can be provided to take advantage of those strengths. Um, and in addition, it's critically important to identify areas of interest or affinities um, that can be included in your child's academics because building on those areas can make a huge difference in terms of having success in school. Since the um, focus of attitude is ADHD, uh, we're going to use ADHD and attention as uh, sort of a surrogate for the conversation, but please know that uh, the key principles that we're talking about go beyond that. But while we're talking about it, I think it's important to know that even the diagnosis of ADHD really needs to be clarified. Uh, I fear that somehow we've created the, the misimpression that attention is sort of a yes or no, either you have ADHD or you don't, and it's important to know that attention is, is really a complex set of controls in our brain that affect a whole bunch of things, including learning and, and thinking or cognitive function, uh, how we're regulating our behavior and how we're interacting or how we're managing our interpersonal relations. And we now know that attention lives in at least three different control centers in our brain so that there isn't just one attention, if you would, uh, and one part of attention would be the mental energy controls, uh, which are responsible for initiating and maintaining the brain energy level needed for optimal learning and behavior. Uh, this is important uh, because, for example, typically children who are struggling with their mental energy controls sort of paradoxically need to move. Um, we know that muscle movements and moving around often helps sort of stimulate the brain and recharge the batteries so that children oftentimes who are struggling with sitting still um, are oftentimes the moving around is perceived as the problem when moving around may actually be the way your child is compensating for uh, difficulty attending. And so insisting a child with attention difficulties who's struggling with mental energy deficits is, is really going to be counterproductive. Uh, and so it becomes really important, for example, for kids to be allowed to move or to build that into their plan. So understanding that, for example, as, um, uh, as part of the uh, attention difficulties is going to be important. Processing controls typically refer to uh, the ability to focus on uh, how we're taking information in, uh, whether or not we're, our mind is wandering, whether or not we're missing important details. And these are the kids who are making what are called careless mistakes. Uh, and we hate that word because uh, it isn't a matter that they're careless, it's a matter that they are uh, sort of not able to focus deeply enough to pick up those minor errors. Uh, and so it becomes important uh, because oftentimes they're getting punished because they're making minor errors, which is perceived as, as carelessness or, or lack of uh, a care, but it's really part of the problem. And that's something that one would, would need some strategies for. Uh, the production controls refer to really uh, regulating behavior and, and work output, everything from planning what you're about to do to impulsivity and not being able to sit still or not being able to uh, keep 
oneself from doing the first thing that comes to mind. Um, but you can see how understanding where the breakdowns are within attention are going to be important in terms of building the IEP or 504 plan because what you need to be thinking about is how does my child's attention problem impact performance, behavior, what does that mean in terms of supports and strategies, and also uh, on the flip side, uh, how are we going to make sure that we're not punishing a child uh, because of this disability. Uh, and so if impulsivity is a manifestation of the ADHD, uh, then uh, it's important uh, to make sure that that is not perceived as, um, you know, it's behavioral, uh, but really uh, that this is a manifestation of your child's disability and that needs to be attended to and addressed um, and punishment is not, or, or stigmatization uh, is not appropriate. The other question to always think about is, is what else is going on um, for a number of reasons. One is that attention dysfunction rarely exists in isolation. Uh, we, we hear the term comorbidities, uh, but an important point to bear in mind is that when a child is classified as eligible for services, first of all, um, it doesn't limit the IEP to that primary area that you've been classified with. So for example, if a child has attention deficit disorder, it doesn't mean that they, they don't need strategies for reading or strategies for writing. Uh, so that you want to realize that, it, that you don't just, you, you can't, it's not as if you must just have one thing. Um, so we always consider what else might be going on. Uh, active working memory uh, or working memory as people often talk about it, it's sort of a cognitive workspace. It's where we hold multiple pieces of information while we're using it. It's where you hold step two and three of a series of instructions while you're completing step one. Um, receptive language is understanding language and we see children who are apparently not focused in the classroom that we discover have tr significant challenges with, with language and imagine sitting through uh, eight hours of class where somebody's speaking a foreign language and you have no idea what they're saying, uh, very, very hard to, uh, to focus. Uh, or children have difficulty expressing themselves, uh, difficulty man uh, uh, coordinating their finger movements when they're uh, using their pencil or pen to write or difficulty uh, storing information in their long-term memory. So whenever, whether it's ADHD or something else, it's important to know that the assessment needs to look at every suspected area of disability and the IEP and 504 plan needs to address all of those areas. If, as we were saying, the problem isn't just attention, and if we go back to the very beginning of this discussion, we were talking about the fact that the FAPE, the free appropriate public education, needs to be appropriate. It has to address all these areas where there are deficits or problems or challenges, call them what we will. So there may be, for these children, a need for specialized instruction in reading. Maybe they need speech and language therapy or occupational therapy. And often a student would benefit from counseling to address emotional issues. So that once you've determined that a student is eligible, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, that student is entitled to services and accommodations and special education for all of the areas that he or she finds challenging. So as Paul said, if ADHD is what you use to open the door, it does not mean that there wouldn't be services and, and specialized supports available for other things. Extended time is, is obviously an important consideration. It almost always comes up. Uh, and a, just a couple of caveats. Um, one is that uh, too often, we see that an IEP is focused just on accommodations 
And so giving a child extended time is not sufficient. Um, typically one wants to figure out why they need extended time. And, and it becomes important to provide strategies to address what is the underlying problem that is leading to the need for extended time. The other thing to, to know is that we agree it's important to advocate for extended time when it's appropriate as early as possible. Now, just know that just because a child had an, uh, you know, had an assessment doesn't automatically mean they're going to get extra time. But if a child needs it and is entitled to it, it's important to implement it early because as kids move through the grades, having a track record early on makes it a lot easier to obtain extended time when people are really concerned about it for SATs and, and um, exams after, uh, you know, after high school uh, and having that track record becomes important. You should be aware that when you get extended time, there is no asterisk, nobody knows. It's not something that is out there for people to see. So there isn't a, a downside to it, um, although sometimes we find that schools do administer extended time in stigmatizing ways, and that becomes important. Um, and the other is that um, extended time in and of itself may not be a solution, and so it's important to think about teaching your child how to use the extended time, particularly with kids who have attention deficit disorder. The issue is that they need to slow down so that they won't make errors. The truth is that most of them, not most of them, but a lot of them blast through the test faster than everybody else, uh, and, and then you get into a debate at the IEP meeting when you say the child needs extra time and the teacher says he's finished 10 minutes before everybody else, and you know the pushback is, well, he needs extra time, uh, but we need to teach him how to use it. Just one more point on extra time. You should be aware that the SAT and ACT exams are extended time or other accommodations are applied for through the school. This wasn't always the case, but it is the case now. And the questions that the school has to address when dealing with the, the college board or the ACT people is not only does the student have extended time in school, but is he or she using that extended time? So if Johnny has time and a half for his in-school exams, but doesn't want to take them with extended time because perhaps he has to take them in a different room so he has more time. And often extended time includes a quiet location. So if Johnny says no, 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 and, and doesn't go ahead and use it, the school can't in all honestly, honesty say that he's been not only getting extended time but using and benefiting from it. So it's important to talk to your child about the implications of not taking advantage of extended time if he or she has it. Let's talk for a second about behavior. So many students who have ADHD or other learning challenges have behavioral difficulties. They may be frustrated. They may not be able to control their impulses. They may do the first thing that comes to their mind. The uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act does provide for certain examinations of behavior, but the language in the law and its regulations is really rather vague. There are two pieces to this. When behavior is a significant issue, a school should conduct what they call an FBA, a functional behavioral assessment. The only time that that's actually mandated, when it's actually required as part of an evaluation, if, is if a student is in difficulty and whether the question is whether this, this behavior is a manifestation of his or her behavior. So that the only significant serious behaviors that interfere with that student's ability to learn really require a functional behavioral assessment. But you as a parent can say, let's look at the behaviors that are going on. And the school is required to assess in all suspected areas of disability. Flowing from this behavioral assessment can be a behavioral intervention plan. You may hear it referred to as a BIP. And that would be a plan to deal with behaviors that are flowing from the child's disabilities, whether it's ADHD alone, ADHD and something else, 
Many children have underlying emotional issues, again, in conjunction with other things. So that if a child is consistently pushing others in the hallway because he or she isn't able to use their words to affect what it is they want to have happen, that's something that could be picked up on this sort of an examination. So you should just be familiar with the terminology that there is such a thing as a functional behavioral assessment. Your school may not offer it except under the most extreme behavioral problems. And flowing from that may well be a behavioral intervention plan. It can stand on its own or it could be part of an IEP. Now, just to mention medication, parents will sometimes come to us and say that the school says that if we don't put Johnny on medication, they're going to do something. It's usually a vague threat of, of somehow or other segregating Johnny from his classmates. Schools are prohibited by law from requiring parents to medicate a child as a condition of attending school, receiving an evaluation, or receiving services. And we should clearly differentiate this from the fact that students, schools can medicate a child if a doctor orders medication. And if a student requires medication for attention or diabetes or anything or asthma during the course of the school day, the school can give the child the medication with an appropriate doctor's instruction. But to require a child to be medicated in a public school, and I, I'm going to get to that in a second, is not permitted by law. So if a teacher in a public school says, you know, I think Johnny needs medication, they can say that they, what they observe, but they can't put it much further than that. Now, in a private school, anything is possible, and they're not required to be as constrained as they are in a public school. But you should be aware of the limits on public schools with respect to medicating children. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what we want to see in an IEP or 504 plan. And one of the reasons for identifying the particular area of breakdown is that we, we want to see strategies or interventions or supports in place to address the area that's challenging for the child. Um, and typically, so for example, um, and I always think about it in terms of going to the gym and isolating the muscle that you want to work on, that when you identify where the breakdown is, you want to segregate that troublesome step as a separate activity or stage. If a child is having trouble sounding out words because they're having difficulty breaking words into sounds, then the reading specialist is going to be working on breaking words into sounds. Kids with attention deficits oftentimes will have difficulty not just with focus and staying attentive, but have difficulty because they're not sure what's important to focus on. Uh, and so that even if they're on medication or even if they're getting other supports, they may need some help in knowing what they need to focus on. And that might mean, for example, that if they're in a high school class and students are required to take notes, uh, they may not know what notes, what's the important information to take down in their notes, or they may be having difficulty identifying the main idea when they read. Uh, or, or if a child is having difficulty uh, with self-monitoring and has a blind spot more than most in terms of picking up their own errors, they may need strategies to identify those errors. So that walking into the meeting and understanding if we're talking about ADHD or attention problems, where is the attention breakdown and what strategies are we going to put in place to help with that area of breakdown also want to talk about bypass strategies because we think an important part of an IEP uh, isn't to lower expectations but to lower barriers and give children the tools that they need to be successful. And people often will be concerned when we talk about bypass strategies because they'll say, well, aren't these crutches? And I always say, well, you know, if you have a broken leg, your leg's not going to heal if you don't get a crutch. So that the part of it is one that we want to allow your child to experience success and be successful while we're working on the problem. So for example, if a child is having difficulty focusing on, um, if a child has difficulty reading uh, and has a reading problem, 
having the child have access to audiobooks uh, allows them to uh, to access the content that their classmates is also accessing using things like uh, speech to text or keyboarding uh, as a bypass strategy for children who are having difficulty with graphomotor functions, um, providing notes in advance for students who are having difficulty with working memory uh, and, and have difficulty sort of focusing on the lecture and taking notes at the same time. So providing specific bypass strategies because part of what the IEP needs to accomplish is allowing your child to access the curriculum or perform consistently with their, their, their cognitive ability. And that also means, therefore, building on their strengths and using their strengths. Parents are part of the IEP and 504 teams. Now, in terms of how it, this, these laws work from state to state, the rights of parents are stronger in, under the IDEA. Some states are not as generous with parental rights under 504. But it's important for parents to know that they have a mandated role in the IEP team. They should start their role by first going back to what Paul said earlier and reflect that the evaluation that they're bringing to the table upon which the IEP is built reflects their child's profile of strengths and challenges. Now, what happens if the school does an evaluation and it doesn't ring true for you as a parent? At that point, we generally consider that parents should think about getting an independent educational evaluation, an IEE. And there's a provision in the IDEA that says if a parent is not happy with the evaluation, that they should advise the district that they're seeking an IEE an independent educational evaluation. The district will has two choices. They can either say, okay, go ahead, or they can bring a hearing before a state hearing officer that gives the parents, that, that challenges the effectiveness of their evaluation. Now, a couple of things here. One is the district doesn't get two bites at the apple. If the district's evaluation is not good, they cannot say back, go back to the parents and say, well, you know what? We're going to fix this. Give us a couple of weeks. We'll do some more testing. Nuh-uh. The law doesn't permit for that. If their evaluation is not good, then they do not get a chance to get a do-over. Now, the districts can set limits on, in terms of the qualifications and the cost of an IEE, although there are um, provisions for getting around these if necessary. But it's important to know that the district really needs to dig down. They need to evaluate in all suspected areas of disability. The results of their evaluation need to feel right. You as a parent know what's going on. And if you do not feel that um, you are getting an answer to the questions that you have, then you need to seek an independent educational evaluation because you can't solve a problem if you don't really have an understanding of what it is. I want to move on to goals. And too often, uh, insufficient time and energy and attention is devoted to establishing goals. Largely, that is often because what typically happens is that there's so much anxiety and angst around whether we get the child classified and now putting services in place uh, that the goals happen toward the end and everybody is tired and worn down. Uh, but I urge you to really pay attention to goals. Uh, they become incredibly important and it, having an appropriate set of goals is critical. Um, oftentimes uh, what will, you know, one can spend a lot of time arguing over very specific parameters of what services are going to be provided, uh, but all of that can be undone if the goals are not set appropriately. The, also from the converse, uh, if the school doesn't agree with services that you feel strongly a child needs to receive uh, and 
you feel like you're banging your head against the wall, uh, an acceptable position is to say, okay, let's put in place some goals and let's see what happens over the next three or four months so that you can always use goals as a way to force the issue to make sure that the child is making progress. Too often, we see goals are really so nonspecific, a child will write a complete sentence 80% of the time that it's not clear how you're going to determine whether they're being met or not. And so what happens is that the IEP keeps on getting rolled forward without any changes. So having an appropriate set of goals is critical. They need to be specific, they need to be objective, and they need to be quantifiable. Um, they optimally, so if they include a measure that you don't understand, push back. When somebody says write a complete sentence 80% of the time, uh, Ask what, what exactly does that mean? How are you going to determine that? Um, optimally, they should include at least some standardized measures that are objective. Um, there must be a clear understanding of who's responsible for, for making the assessment, who's responsible for measuring and assessing progress. How often is that going to happen? How are the parents going to, how are you going to find out how your child is doing? How frequently are you going to be getting updates? Um, and, and a clear understanding up front of what constitutes sufficient progress. What comes next? Well, re remember, so the question is, is the IEP in 504 appropriate on its face? Is it based on a full understanding of your child's issues? As you walk out of the, and let me also say, that you know, when we do an independent evaluation, we participate in the in the committee for special education, and you should feel like you shouldn't be forced to sign the IEP before you review it with the clinician who assessed your child. If you do have an outside uh, advisor, or uh, even if you don't, uh, you shouldn't be felt you shouldn't feel that there's a gun to your head. So you should review the document carefully, and you don't want to be obstructionistic, but you want to say. I need some time to look at this with my partner, I want to talk to some folks, and so is the IEP appropriate on its face? Now going forward, is it being implemented? Is the school providing what they're supposed to provide? Um, are teachers following the plan? Are related services being provided effectively with the right frequency? Um, and, and is it working? Is your child making progress toward his or her goals? Are things getting better? Um, even before you look for measurable results, you want to be seeing that your child is, is feeling better, is enjoying school more, that you're seeing some, some positive results. So what happens if things aren't going well, if you don't see the kind of progress that you would expect, if your child is resisting going to school, if your sense is the school isn't reporting to you as they had promised, what can you do? Well, the first thing you have to know is that it's possible to make small changes in an IEP without holding a meeting or all the time delays that that involves. If both parties agree, the changes can be implemented rather quickly. And we're not talking about adding a full service. We may be talking about modifying something. If your child is getting speech once a week and speech and language once a week is not proving to be sufficient, Perhaps you could add a second session, or if there are certain kinds of reading support and you need to move it up or push it down. Sometimes the child is being pulled out of the classroom too often, and even though you want the services, you're finding that disruptive. So in that case, you may choose to reduce services temporarily. Those kinds of small things that the school and you as parents are in agreement upon can be done with a written change that becomes part of the IEP. If that level of change is not sufficient or the school does not agree to even a small change, it's your right as a parent to seek another IEP meeting at any time. The idea that you could only have an IEP meeting once a year is not correct. You get as many meetings as you need. There is some delay in scheduling them. We all know that that's a problem sometimes. But you do have the right to call another meeting sit down around the table with those same members of the IEP team and explain what the problem is and modify the IEP as necessary. Now, sometimes things that's just not enough. The school, if for a variety of reasons, is just not giving your child what you think is necessary. In that case, you have the right to appeal 
to a state hearing officer. Now, every state has to have a system in place. Some states have a two-level appeal. Some states have a one-level appeal. When you are called to your IEP meeting, you will get a document called um, due process or a statement of due process or instructions for due process. Hang on to that. That gives you the rights in your state as to how you can appeal your decisions. A lot of parents do it on their own. Some parents feel that they need to work with a local attorney. But the fact remains that you have the right to appeal. The IEP team is not the final arbiter of what your child requires. So to reiterate the key points that we want to leave you with today, one is that these plans, IEP or 504, need to be individualized, meaning they need to meet your child's specific needs, need to be specific. They need to have clear and measurable goals. It needs to be a clear understanding of what constitutes success and acceptable progress at the outset. Clearly, no piece of paper is better than the people who are implementing it, and there must be ongoing communication uh, between the teacher between and the parents so that there has to be ongoing communication, and this is not just a once a year kind of thing. And then remember that the IEP is living document. Uh, it is not in stone, uh, and it's important to revisit whether it's working uh, in an ongoing way. And that sort of wraps it up for us, but we're happy to take your questions. Thank you, guys. That, that was super. Um, we have a lot of really interesting questions. Um, I'm going to go back to the very beginning, because there are some listeners who are not sure how to, at the really outset, get their child evaluated. So, for example, here's a question. Um, um, my, my son's, my grandson's school counselor thinks that we need to get him diagnosed um, with ADHD because he had a hard time attention. Who should do this evaluation? Should the school do this evaluation? Um, someone else puts it differently. What are the tests that I need to do in order to get my child declared eligible? So if you could just recap briefly um, how one gets an evaluation um, that leads to the right to an IEP in 504 plan or 504 plan. I think that would be helpful. Sure. Um, and I, I think that there are, you know, and, and Susan will jump in because she's the expert, but one typically approaches the person in school, it may be the principal, it may be the guidance counselor, and one, and the magic words that one says is that I believe my child is eligible for services under IDEA and I'd like him or her to be or 504 or 504 and we're requesting that he or she be assessed in all the areas of suspected disability and typically they'll ask you to sign a document which is a document of permission to be evaluated by the school that um, and what you should know is even if your child's had an outside evaluation the process of uh, of starting the ball rolling in terms of getting services at school always begins with signing a document which gives you school permission to assess your child and you want to make sure that you sign the document uh, and you may want to take a copy of it and keep the dated copy because uh, just informally asking for assessments won't make it won't won't really give you the 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 the, what you need and there's a time limit when you make that request what is it 60 days 60 days at which point a couple of things that you need to be aware of first of all why would you use um, a school evaluation very simply it's free the school is required at no cost to you to evaluate your child so that there are families who would choose before they even deal with the school to get a private evaluation there are families who've had the school evaluation and feel it doesn't ring true. But we always recommend to families that if there's no other particular concern, that they start with a school evaluation. It's not going to cost you anything. It will take some time to complete. And if that evaluation feels like it mirrors your child's issues, then by all means, go ahead with it. There's no reason to do anything else. One, one other caveat, because you want to proceed in parallel, because the school evaluation is going to be um, looking at 
how your child is performing academically, how your child's performing in school. The one of the specific questions are related to ADHD. And so there's a second piece to that, which is the school won't diagnose ADHD. A school will identify that your child is having behavioral or, or academic difficulties, but a diagnosis of ADHD is a medical diagnosis, and that's going to require, um, you know, typically I would start with your pediatrician. Uh, and say to your pediatrician uh, that I have concerns. The school's raised concerns about my child's ability to focus. I think, you know, I'm concerned that he has ADHD, and you know, and, and your pediatrician ought to be able to make that diagnosis or or make a referral for that diagnosis. And so, typically, you'll want those two things in parallel. Also, you need to know that under 504. Some districts will simply take the diagnosis of a pediatrician. You have to understand that 504's requirements for what for qualification are far broader. It just simply has to be a disability that significantly impacts a major life function and learning is a major life function. So if the child is significantly impacted by attention, that definition alone would qualify him or her for 504. You may want to go further and get an IEP, but that's a separate issue. And in fact, a lot of schools will have a 504 form that the physician can fill out and doc, doc, document that the child has a diagnosis of ADHD and we're requesting extended time or you know certain certain services or accommodations. And that may fly in in certain schools. The caution there, though, is that that won't be sufficient. The pediatrician quite often won't necessarily know what kind of reading support your child might need or, or what other kind of academic support. And since the school assessment doesn't cost you anything, there is, in my mind, very little downside in, in doing a deeper assessment, even if it is not as deep as you might want. I would say that even if your pediatrician diagnoses ADHD and gets a 504 for you, um, unless things are really you know, going extremely well, um, I would consider doing, having the school do the more comprehensive assessment anyway, because uh, as we said, typically there are other things going on. Um, I also want to say that on the Attitude website there and on other websites, there are sample letters for to requesting, um, for formally requesting that your school evaluate your child for possible services. And those can be really helpful if, you, if you're trying to get started. Um, um, Hmm. What is the school assessment called once you have an ADHD diagnosis? I think it's the answer is still a school assessment, right? <laughs> so, um, and others are asking, um, is it is it preferable to go to a private assessment? Or I think what you, you just answered that, I think you said start with the school assessment, it's free, and then go from there. Um, as part of the school yes, assessment, I, will they recommend yeah, I, the accommodations? Or um, um, do parents need to have a sense going in of what accommodations they should be requesting? I, I think the answer is yes to both. I think that the culmination of the school assessment is a committee meeting that the parent is part of. And that meeting is, whether it's called the CSE or Committee for Special Education meeting or IEP meeting, but what happens is that at the end of whatever the assessment process is, whatever testing the school does, there is a meeting where all the people that participated in the assessment, and oftentimes it's more than one discipline, so there might be a psychologist doing a part of it, a learning specialist doing a part of it, a speech and language person, an occupational therapist, um, and each person is presenting their piece of the puzzle Parents are in that meeting, and there'll be recommendations made. Uh, it is helpful to go into that meeting with a sense of what you think your child needs or what you're looking for, what you're hoping to have. Um, and oftentimes, you can find an ally in your school. If you have a good working relationship with the teacher in the classroom or, or somebody else who you trust who knows the school well, they may be willing to talk with you offline and say, listen, I really think you need, you know, your kid needs an aid in the classroom, or I really think you should ask for these things. And so I think that it's good to speak to people that are in the classroom, you know, speak to other parents and go into that meeting with a sense of almost what you feel your child must have to be successful, 
what you think would be nice to have, um, and then you know a clear sense of whether or not you get everything you want, you want to make sure that you agree as to how you're going to tell whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is the student question here is from John? Is the student required to be at the meeting with the IEP team? Should the student be at the meeting? I love when students attend the meeting. A lot depends on the student's age, the nature of the student's other issues, but certainly once that student gets to college, he or she's going to be advocating on their own. They don't want to talk to the parents once you're in college. So for high school students, unless they have significant disabilities that would make it difficult for them to participate, I would always urge them to go to their IEP or 504 meetings. Look, it's hard for kids to hear people talking about them. It's mm -hmm. not comfortable. Children don't want to have any issues. They don't want to be different from everybody else. A lot of everybody else also has issues, but that's a separate discussion. So it's, sometimes it's difficult, but if you start bringing a child in middle school to these meetings and explain a little bit about what goes on and even let the child talk, how, the person who knows best how something impacts that child is the child him or herself. So it would seem to me that starting early Bringing your child, and again, you've got to know your kid, but we all do. I mean, you as a parent would know whether that's appropriate, but I would urge you to do that. It's really unfair to a college freshman to drop him off with, you know, his report in hand and say, here, go get yourself accommodations. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think that, you know, how much of the meeting depends on the child. Uh, often schools will balk at having the child there for the whole meeting. Uh, you know, a lot depends on what your child wants, um, mm -hmm. but I think that, uh, you know, we encourage children to be part of the meeting. Also, I think that part of the feedback session after an assessment is to let the child understand how he or she, um, how they learn, and, and so that they're going into the meeting with the sense that they're advocating for themselves. So I think to the degree to which it's developmentally appropriate, the degree to which the child is comfortable, and I think you want to prepare the child for the meeting, I think it's, it's, it's really important. I think another thing that we didn't mention that becomes really important once children are 14 or older is, is a transition plan. Um, and an IEP needs to include a post-high school transition plan, and clearly the child needs to be part of that conversation. Too often the transition plan is one word, college, and that's not a transition plan. Right. So I think that needs to be a clear sense and and just pulling back uh what what i always think about is that you want to think about what the end game is so what's the goal of the iep the goal is to allow your child to have the most options possible at the end of high school for sure and so that as you're talking about the iep I think it also becomes really important to raise one critical question um, that oftentimes parents don't know to ask, which is, is my child going to be eligible? Is my child moving toward a full academic diploma? Um, are we moving toward a full-fledged graduation with a full diploma? Because that's going to make a difference in terms of what options happen afterwards. There is some schools will do, you know, there's something called an IEP diploma, which is something that is not. That, it's not a thing anymore, but the idea is that there, every state has different kinds of diplomas, different academic levels of graduation, and colleges will only accept students who've graduated with a standard, regular, or honor diploma. So mm -hmm. it's, it differs from state to state, locale to locale, but the parents need to ask the questions. Is my kid on track to graduate with an academic diploma that will get him or her into college? Okay. Um, uh, some t questions on timing. So, for example, um, if your child has an IEP going into the next grade, is it one person's asking if they really need to wait several months to sit down with the teachers to have the IEP meeting or the new teachers or whether there is a way to to, to jumpstart the, the process of getting the appropriate accommodations in a school year, assuming that you have an IEP or 504 plan that, that is working. How does it go? How does it transition from year to year? It transitions automatically from year to year. In fact, 
in general, and this is a big generalization, schools like to hold an IEP meeting in the spring that would apply to the following school year. So that if your child is moving from grade to grade, the, certainly the things like extended time, uh, reading pullouts, speech and language support would all be in place from year to year. You can interrupt that cycle by calling for another IEP meeting. But if you had a meeting, let's say in May, you're likely to have another meeting called the following May. And each May you would have a meeting absent something special. And you would look back at the year that's been and you'd look forward at the year that's coming and see what courses might be an issue, that sort of thing. So it's not a matter of having to have an IEP meeting at the beginning of the year to start the year. That IEP remains in effect until the next one is implemented. So it's absolutely not acceptable for the school to say, you know, we need about six weeks to get things in place. No, you have an IEP and you need to begin the year with those things in place. Um, also what we're seeing is, you know, more and more school districts when your child's moving from elementary to middle school, that there's a transition meeting where the, where the IEP team at the middle school is convening with the elementary school at the end of the child's academic year prior to enrollment. So, so again, in May, for example, right, okay, yeah. So there should be continuity, uh, and there's really no excuse for, uh, for there to be a lag uh, because we need time to get brought up to speed. That's just not, not acceptable. Not acceptable, okay. Um, there are three or four questions here along these lines. Um, my son is doing well in school has always done well in school, but is now struggling, um, or my, the school is hesitating on formal assessments because they feel he's making progress and they don't see him struggling, or my child has gets good grades, but cl is clearly struggling in certain areas and the school's hesitant to do an evaluation. Do you have any advice for, for parents who, who are in that situation, those situations? Yeah, I, think it, I think you should have, I, I, I I don't think you should take no for an answer. I think you have to advocate strongly for an assessment. If your gut tells you, I remember about 10 years ago, a mother came to see me and she said, my kid's a duck. And I thought she was, you know, she seemed pretty sane. And I said, tell me what you mean by your kid's a duck. And she, <laughs> she said, you know, when you look at a duck on the pond, everything looks smooth, but underneath his legs are going a million miles an hour. And I see how hard he's working and this is not sustainable. The teachers see the surface of the pond and they think everything's fine. And quite often, you know, a child is doing beautifully, you know, she's a dream all day and she comes home and is throwing books in her bedroom. So that I think that you shouldn't take no for an, an answer. Uh, I think you have to push and say, no, our child needs an assessment. We suspect that there's a, that there's a problem. And in fact, we work with a lot of graduate students and college students and it becomes, and medical students for that matter, and it becomes a lot harder to get accommodations um, if you don't push for them early on. So the track record right. becomes important. So go with your gut uh, and push. And if you feel your child needs an assessment, the fact that they're getting good grades does not mean that they don't have a, a disorder. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't need support. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and that point I think is, is so well taken. You're, you're, you can't wait until senior year in high school and, and expect to get uh, accommodations in college. You need you need that track record early on. Um, I have an interesting question from someone who says, do you have any suggestions on informal ways to share IEP goals with teachers in a more personal manner than in the um, in the in the formal formal IEP meeting? I, to, to, uh, I, I guess the question is. Um, I wouldn't so, recommend doing it. In, I wouldn't recommend doing it instead of an IEP. But I do believe that it is wise to sit down with the teacher and have an early conference and okay. talk about, you know, informally in that classroom. It, it's always best, you know, the teacher. Uh, it's always best to have a good working relationship with the teacher and to sit down together and have a mutual understanding. You know, will you? You know, how do you want to communicate? Uh, okay. Will you send? every Friday. So I, I absolutely recommend having a, a conference as early in the year as possible to get those things laid out, um, but not instead of the IEP, uh, right. but as an adjunct to it. Okay. Um, there's um, a special ed teacher listening in, and he just posted something interesting. He said, we meet with the middle school 
IEP meetings during the last 60 to 90 days of the year for eighth graders and then make sure that teachers at the beginning of the school year get copies of IEPs for their students in the first two weeks of school. So there, don't we all wish we were in his school district? <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds sounds ideal. Um, I just want to, we don't have very much time left, unfortunately. I want to go to your point about goals, which I think everyone found very interesting. Can you give us some specific examples that m might be pertinent of, of the kinds of tangible, quantifiable goals that you've seen work well in IAPs or 504s? Sure, you know, I mean, the, the one thing that jumps to my mind most easily relates to reading goals, for example. Um, and there are what are called leveled reading assessments, things like either something called DRA or Fontes, Fontes and Pinnell, but there are levels where one can, they're reading A to Z, but that people talk about terms like a child's independent reading level, their instructional reading level, their frustrational reading level, and that becomes a measurable, clearly understood way of describing progress in reading. Uh, and so that you'd want some kind of leveled metrics. It doesn't require a reassessment. You don't need a psychologist, um, but some kind of leveled metrics of of reading would be would be an example. Okay, that's 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 a helpful. Um, I'm so sorry we're out of time. There are so many interesting questions here. I know this is a topic that that um, is of great interest to everyone. Um, I hope the Yellens will come back and everyone, um, Susan Yellen writes a regular column in Attitude and I urge you to look on the website because there is a great deal of interesting material. Um, next Wednesday, we have a fascinating uh, Jerome Schultz who is really wonderful talking about helping motivate children with ADHD. And then later in the month, um, Teresa Maitland is going to talk in September about how to help your high school student learn to advocate for him or herself, which is a key life skill. Um, and she's going to talk in some granularity about how to, how to help your child identify where they need help, what that help might be, what they do to get it and how they, what they do if they're not getting what they need. And again, we can do everything we want for our kids, but they need to ultimately learn to advocate for themselves. So check back and um, we're, we're in the middle of our back to school webinar series and there's some, some really interesting topics coming up. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, all of the Yellen, Yellen uh, Institute folks. And don't forget to take advantage of that added, that time timer ADD 20% uh, discount, which is pretty great. Thanks everybody, see you soon. Thank you, bye-bye.